Hello, everyone. Welcome into Jason's Lightbox. I didn't want to mess around today, and I wanted to come straight for the Lightbox. This is a continuation video from yesterday. This is officially my sixth day of seven days of celebration because you, each and every one of you, got me over 7,000 subscribers in just a matter of, I think it's just over six months now that I've been doing videos. So thank you so, so much for all the love. And I appreciate each and every one of you right underneath my hand to start the video. One of the most magnificent brooches you will see me um, show in costume jewelry. We'll zoom in. Um, I wanted to mention the rings. This is a Bakelite dice ring that I made, sterling silver, and uh, very oversized, but what my work was known for. And then a tubular constructed ring out of sterling silver tubing, and the entire shank is tubing. Very big accomplishment in sterling silver. If you want to see both of these rings close up in another video, please go over to my insane silver smithing video that I did very early on. Just go to my other videos and scroll down. Today I wanted to give a very quick and special thank you to Thelma at Thelma Thrift and also D at The Thrill of the Thrift. If you want to see two incredibly beautiful and, and fun and honest and loyal women who have two incredible channels, please go over to Thelma Thrift and D at The Thrill of the Thrift. You will be um, fascinated by both channels. Um, they are people that I met on YouTube early on. And I have to remember where I came from. They were both very generous to me um, and really encouraged me in my channel and still do to this day. So ladies, you are um, fantastic and I truly think of you as friends. So thank you so much for all you did for me early on. The video today is about Trafari jewelry and it's a continuation from my video that I did the other day, just yesterday. I did a video on affordable and the Trafari that you can readily and easily find. Today's video is a step up from that. This is the Trafari that is more difficult to find and slightly more valuable. This very first brooch that you're looking at um, was made, you know, they, they kind of, um, they will not necessarily disagree at times on dating certain pieces, but this was the late, late, late 1930s and into the 1940s. It may have been designed in the 30s and then produced in the 1940s, but this is um, a pot metal, and then it is so beautifully hand enameled. And the surface is just so lush and beautiful. An ear of corn with this beautiful whiplash lines. Very reminiscent of Art Nouveau. Very naturalistic. And who would have worn an ear of corn brooch back then? You have to think of the whimsy that went into some of these designs and some of the craft to set these stones that are so small. It is signed on the back of the fur clip mechanism right here. So there's a double prong fur clip mechanism that's spring loaded and it's signed right up there, Trafari. Back in the day, I purchased this brooch for around $80. And I think they were asking, 95 and I think they came down to 80. I, I think they did. This brooch today, there's one on eBay that the ear of corn is yellow and they're offering it for $3,950. $3,950 for a brooch that has basically no intrinsic value. Pot metal, rhodium plating, and rhinestones with cold painted enamel. So there's really no intrinsic value in this. There's no diamonds, no gold, no platinum. This is purely costume jewelry at its most beautiful form. And look at the size of this brooch. So I wanted to bring on some of the more notable pieces. And this was designed by Alfred Philippe. And I think, again, the circuit dating, if someone were to show me this at an appraisal fair, which I do appraisals fair every week still now, um, I would say that this would be circa 1940, Alfred Philippe Trafari. And I would appraise it 
between 2,500 and 3,500, I wouldn't be comfortable going above 3,500. But that's, you know, because the brooch online didn't sell for the price I mentioned previously. Um, you'll have to look at comps and see what they sell for, and this is very difficult to find. It's a very uh, difficult brooch to find. The next one that I bring on is the brooch that I brought on a, a few days ago, um, and one rhinestone was missing, so um, I do restoration, and again, it was one or well, that one or this one that was missing, the little clear stones in between. This is also Trafari, and this would be circa, circa dated, again, late 30s, possibly in design, transitioning into the 1940s. So this was very reminiscent of the 1920s. And um, the carved or faux carved glass stones that look like peridot, and then it also looks like moonstone, those are so absolutely gorgeous. Look how breathtaking the craft is on that fan-shaped brooch. Again, I paid $15 for this out at the flea market, I think about 15 or 16 years ago. There's the crown trafari mark, again, on this double-pronged fur clip mechanism. And I have a tendency to wear these on velvet or velveteen coats. Just a thicker fabric that those pins then wouldn't put a big hole through. There's the little prong there to hold that to the fabric. The mark down here, I believe that's patent pending. A lot of times Trafari um, would apply for the patents and actually put the pieces into production before the patent would, would be accepted. Um, before the design patent was actually gone through. Now, you can go on, there's a website online for Trafari, and you can go on and research all of the patent dates, and then you'll see the illustrations for this brooch with that mechanism on the back of it. So it'll show you the front of the brooch and then also the back. It may also mention that this was Alfred Philippe. Um, it, it might also mention the designer at the time, but that brooch and the craft is incredible. That one today would be around 2200 to maybe 2400 I think it would sell for that. Um, I think if you, you know, needed to insure some of these pieces, it'd be very difficult because you're not going to find it in the exact color combination. So that's a lot of money for pot metal and rhinestone and glass. So I just wanted to show you some of the more, um, I guess you could say some of the more desirable um, Trafari pieces. And I zoom in so you can see, look how most of those stones are actually bead set. The metal is folded over. Some of them are not. Some of them are still glued in at that time. But boy, those glass. Glass stones are sure prong set. I love the elegance of this brooch. And again, gigantic. Let me zoom out a little bit more. Look how large that is. It's so big. Uh, very bold, very beautiful, and I love the radiating design. Very graphic, very strong. Let's go into a brooch that I mentioned previously, and I don't like bringing things on that I've already brought on in past videos, but I did kind of a catch-all of masterworks of costume jewelry early on, and I will settle into the top 20 designers that I would tell you to look for. Um, Again, that's all subjective information. This would be considered Trafari A-line. Look how gigantic this is. Most costume jewelry firms had an A, B, and C line. I know that Miriam Haskell had it as well. That's based on complexity of design, the way the stones are set, and how long a piece would take to finish. This is gigantic, all completely rhodium plated on the back. And this one is signed. Let me make sure I find the signature. Let me back it out. I, again, I, here we go. Uh, I almost lost track of it. It's very small. So a lot of people will overlook that. It's right there. Trafari with a little crown T above it. And um, there's the copyright right after it. So there's the C in the circle, but that's Trafari. And I don't think there was a patent pending on this because they already had the patent in place. Now pay attention, please pay attention to these triangular set stones on the outside. Look at those tapered baguettes. 
They get very small on the inside and go all the way large around the outside. And then that triangular shaped stone with all these amazing blue Aurora Borealis. When people talk about rhinestone jewelry, they sometimes don't bring on examples like this because they're increasingly hard to find. This brooch full retail, I would suspect that this would go between $1,500 and $1,800. Now, it may go as low as $1,200. It wouldn't go under $1,000, and it might go closer to $2,000, and that's today's pricing. I paid, I think I paid $80 for this and over 18 years ago. So don't be discouraged and say you can't find such pieces. You can. They are out there. And I keep telling people, please check rummage sales, flea markets, garage sales. These items are still out there amongst us. We just have to get out and look for them. Please be well-versed when you go out to find these pieces as well. Now, I bring these two on because it shows something very interesting. It shows the same basic brooch and form, the same size, the same kind of design, the, the same basic idea. This brooch is by Weiss. So that's another company, Weiss. The metal is Japaned, um, beautifully crafted, little green rhinestones, and this one is by Trafari. So I'll set this one down because we're not talking about Weiss today, but we are talking about Trafari. Sometimes you will find the same exact brooch, but the outside will be enameled in green. That version is slightly more than the brush gold tone, but look how they set those pearls in there to look like peas in a pod. Very whimsical. Could you imagine the lady in the late 1950s that wore a pea pod brooch? Very cool, very whimsical. I would have been friends with her, for sure. I would have absolutely been friends with her. She would have wore her pea pod, and I would have wore my big light dice. <laughs> so there's the Trafari mark right there. And um, very well crafted. Again, this one... Um, it sells for around um, 165 to 165 to 185 is what the going rate is now on the enameled one that sells slightly higher, 225 to 245 in today's um, um, you know uh, buying and selling um, values. So. I loved the simplicity and the elegance of this. And then the Weiss version with the rhinestones sells for about the same. Sells for around mm, 150 to 160 on this one. Um, so they're, they're very, and, and look at the pair of them. I would wear them together. I, I absolutely would. I'd wear them together on a coat. Why not? They have such a conversation with each other, right? <laughs> oh, so whimsical. But I wanted to show you a very similar design um, from Weiss and then from Trafari. So um, at the same time period, by the way, these earrings just came in to me today. I got lucky. I went out to the Hartfield Flea Market, where I'm a regular, <laughs> and I bought these Trafari clip-on earrings. These are by Trafari. They have hallmarks all over them. Trafari, Sterling, and then the patent number. Now, if you run the patent number online, I think you can go on Google. And I don't do a lot of Google um, searching, but if you go on Google, I think you could type in to see exactly when that patent was applied for and who applied for the patent. And these are great. These are lucite bellies and um, they are completely clear. This one got a little fogged up because it got, you know, hot in my hand because <laughs> I'm all hot and bothered today. Um, and then the little red rhinestone eyes with this clear lucite belly. These are technically jelly bellies. And this brings me into another jelly belly, which is this large sailfish. So we'll bring him on, and then we'll bring on this tiny baby sailfish. We'll bring that one on. So there's the baby to the mother. And then we'll bring on the sea turtle, and then we will bring on the frog. <laughs> you know, and I keep trying to tell people I've been collecting, and I've been reselling the whole time I've been collecting. So when people question me and say, how could you afford to do this? How could you afford to put a collection together like this? Well, because, you know, I worked um, several jobs uh, throughout my life. And, and at the same time, um, I think the one, one year I had five jobs. <laughs> one year of my life, I had five jobs. And um, I would invest along the way. So here are the earrings I bought today. I would say, well, I paid 65 
for the pair. They're in great condition with the original Gold Vermeil. I would say a retail on these. Now, I did see a pair on eBay maybe a couple months ago, um, and I saw them on for like four hundred and four hundred forty nine dollars. Um, that was. You know, it was a bit steep. I mean, I think back in the day they were worth that. I would say on a pair of earrings, um, maybe closer to like two, mm, two fifty five to two seventy five for those. I think is fair. The sea turtle, um, he's sterling silver, or um, he or she is sterling silver. Look at the attention to detail in the rhinestone accents. The gold vermeil surface is still intact. The little red eyes are still there. The lucite belly is in really good condition. And why these were so popular back, you know, in the day, late fifties on on most of these. Um, the reason why these were so popular is the fabric that you were wearing. This brooch would go with anything you were wearing. Look, if you were wearing peach colored or, you know, uh, uh, light pink color, that would pick up the color there. I wish I had something blue. Where is all of my colored stuff? <laughs> I don't have anything. But it would pick up the color of the fabric. Let me get something dark. It would pick up the color of the fabric that you were wearing. Look, he becomes charcoal gray with this beautiful um, push and pull of bending the light through that lucite belly. Anyways, this is marked on the back, and, and these are always marked Trafari. Well, not always marked Trafari, but most of the time they're marked Trafari with the little crown above the T. This one is sterling, and it probably has the patent number as well. Yeah, I think that's the patent number on this one. So again, you can run the patent number and see exactly when this design was patented. And then there is no argument over how old this is. But you got to remember, some of these were made pre-patent, and some of them were made during, and some of them were made after the patent. So there is some grace of about, you know, five to eight years when you're certain a dating something, you know, and I always like to tell historians, don't fight with each other because it's not a good look. Um, it's just not. This one is beautifully put together. Look at the little screw that then holds this flipper above where the lucite was set in. So that's craft. That's craft and design. This little tiny flipper of this um, seal was um, was was a separate piece See, two-part construction here, and then a screw that then screwed that tiny little part on to hold the lucite belly in. And look how chubby he is. Such the chubby character. Look at that happy face. How could you wear this and not have a great day? Um, I would encourage this for some YouTubers. <laughs> you know, this would make anyone, this would make the most sourpuss happy. <laughs> so this is rhinestones in sterling. Again, the gold surface is, is literally gone, is completely worn off. As collectors, we didn't care. Now, the, um, the rhinestone ball at the top, there were other colors that were offered. I think, from memory, I think a green, a red, and a purple, I think for this top, you know, stone, which is the seal's ball. You know, this performing seal had to have something to balance on his nose. Why not a giant faux sapphire? I've worn this one quite a bit. I loved the whimsy of this one. Now, the other one that I wore a lot was the tarantula um, or the spider. Um, and I couldn't find that for the video. These are bullet-shaped cabochon glass eyes. So those are basically cabochon glass. They look like emerald. So I always bring those on to say to people, those are not emerald, those are glass. And those are what are considered bullet-shaped cabochons. Bullet-shaped cabochons that are then bezel set. Now, if those were more squared off, and um, more a square or a soft rectangle, that's what they would then call sugar loaf stones. Um, and the sugar loaf stones were um, basically cut and used by fine jewelers way back when and set in platinum and surrounded with diamonds. There's the Trafari mark right there. And there is the sterling mark right here. And look, there is the patent number right there. One, two, five. And it looks like one, seven, two. That's what it looks like. Uh, we could double check that for sure. Um, we will double check that, but that's what that looks like there. So you can run that patent number and see when this was, was produced. Now, on the um, tarantula, it is signed sterling and does have the patent number, but look how that um, the frog's gesture is. Let's go back to this and not rush today. This is a celebration. There should be no time limit on it, right? <laughs> um, so this is carved lucite, um, and, and look at how that pushes and pulls the light. I love things that weren't, that didn't look common. That's why I went after these back in the day. And then there's the gigantic 
sailfish, again, sterling, trefari, fabulous, wonderful. The stones, people would say, oh, those are yellowed. They need to be cleaned. Uh, 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 uh. Don't start soaking these in Windex. Don't start using liquid. Don't use a, uh, a, a harsh abrasive or a toothbrush. You'll scrub every single stone right out of those fins. I've always let my rhinestones look their age. I never cared when they went yellow. Most purist collectors don't. Most purist collectors know. Most advanced collectors know. That's acceptable. Do we want to see it? No, not particularly. When it happens, do we care? No, we don't. Um, and that's amongst the, um, you know, very, um, uh, very astute collectors of costume that know that that's going to happen. Look at the gesture of that tail, the bend of that tail. Look at that. Again, a separate piece that was then riveted to this outside to hold the Lucite belly in. So just this little comma-shaped sterling part right here that completes the tail. Look, they rivet it through. They riveted that in place. Now, when you don't see that, and you see that cast as one piece, that would be a reproduction. Be aware of the two-part construction because they did reproduce the jelly bellies and quite frequently. I have seen the um, Pekingese dog, the giraffe. Uh, I'm trying to think of the ones uh, going on memory here. Uh, the ones that I've seen as reproductions, and there are a lot of them. So please be careful. This is an adorable trefari. It's the small sailfish. There's some scratches to the lucite from behind where this pin unfortunately scratched the lucite this is trafari crown t right there there is the patent number again most of these jelly bellies will have that not necessarily all of them will this is screwed together again a two-part construction make sure that screw is there and looks like this and again look at the age of the metal that would be very very difficult to forge or fake Look at those little tiny rhinestones and that glass cabochon eye. What a stunning and handsome fellow. Now, value, that's a little bit tough. These have seen a, a, a great crescendo and a great climb, and then they've seen a, a, a fail a few years ago. Now they've started to go right back up where they were. The earrings, like I said before, I would still feel comfortable right around 245 to 275 That's what I would expect to get for those. Um, the turtle, <clears throat> I would say between... Um, I gotta be careful here. I'm just gonna give an approximate. I would say, um, on a really bad day, 700, and then on a really good day, maybe 1500, 1600. Um, the seal, about the same. The frog, about the same. Now, you could say approximately $1200. You, you, you could go with that. Could you go lower? Sure. You know, maybe $750, $850. And then I just have to be careful because when the video airs, maybe in Six months, they go up to twenty-two or twenty-five hundred. You know, supply and demand. These are very difficult to find. Um, very, very difficult to find these days. And then the sailfish, the large one, probably eighteen hundred. Uh, and then on the smaller one, probably twelve hundred, fifteen hundred. That at least gives you a little bit of a value. And then I always tell people, don't take a seller or a collector's word for it. Go out there and f find out what your pieces are worth. You know, go out and take a look around and see what the comps are and see what is current. The values change drastically. And when I give my presentations at the libraries, people trust me to be accurate with values. And there hasn't been a time in now uh, 14 years of doing the appraisals that I've had someone call me to say, hey, you're wrong. <laughs> and that's an amazing feat when I'm appraising everything from jewelry to general line antiques. Um, why I show you, let's grab this one too. I'm going to kind of do this out of order. I had these laid out for reason. This one is unsigned. This one is attributed to Trafari. We're not exactly sure because there were other companies producing such figural enamels. Now, I'll do some additional, additional research. This has only been with me maybe about five or six years. The way the stones are set, the gesture and the sensitivity to the metal, how fine these legs are, this French poodle, the whole design really is reminiscent of what Trafari was very well known for. Just because something isn't signed doesn't mean it's not Trafari. 
This also could be a few other companies. I don't really want to get into it because I don't want to start mentioning other companies. Um, you know, we have MB, um, uh, Boucher, we have uh, Deja, we have a couple other early Coro, we have a couple companies that were producing this general design this general idea at the same time period as Trafari. But when you look at the sensitivity of this signed Trafari enamel brooch and this unsigned French poodle, you can see that there's a very uh, a, a, a proximity of design that's very similar. You can't just laminate on that this is Trafari. You can't just stick on here and say, this is Trafari. We have had so many historians be corrected over the years because then when we find the pieces that do have the patent number on it or do have a um, patent pending mark on it, then we go to the database and we look up the design and it's attributed to a certain designer, which then attributes it to a certain producer. So as unsigned, I would say more than likely Trafari on this one. Unsigned beauty, but look at the way the stones are set. Each one is bead set. There's a little tiny dot of metal that's hit with a kind of a rheostatic hammer. Um, it punches the metal to hold the stone in. Um, look at the detail, these tiny little legs. And to think that these legs didn't break off, that is soft pot metal. It's spelter. It's in the white metal family that's been rhodium plated. The little blue eye, the little bow in this poodle's hair. What a beautiful little girl. Very whimsical and great condition. I paid $40 at an auction years ago. I wouldn't be afraid to pay up to $300 for this now. Softly attributed to Trafari, I would I would say worth between five hundred and twenty five and maybe six hundred and twenty five dollars. Might go higher than that if you have a collector who knows that this is or is not Trafari. Um, but yeah, the construction really well done, very well constructed. Loved this pin for a long time. Um, and sometimes on early Trafari, you will see just a letter or a number mark. And look, the tail almost looks like it may have been bent at a time and almost broke off. But that tail's still there and still holding on. And thank God for that, that'd be very difficult to fix. So love that. All right, now that I got distracted by an unsigned poodle pin, we'll go to the signed Trafari pin. Any of the Trafari enamels, look at the quality of this, the two-tone stem, the graceful line, the graceful gesture. What an incredible floral, purple flowers. Green leaves, but highlighted. You will see wear to the enamel from time to time that can be retouched. I've always, in my collection, I've always let things be what they are. I wouldn't repaint that. That's history. That's history of the piece. If you want new, buy new. If you want old like this, buy authentic. Don't, you know, don't redo it. There's no reason to. Uh, the Trafari on the clip. And I wasn't lecturing you as to, you know, really what you have to do. That was just what I did. You know, I, I tried to keep my things as beautiful and as truthful as they could be. So that um, uh, online, this one would now go between, uh, because of the size and the condition and the quality, that would go between five and 600. It might go slightly higher. That might go closer to, you know, 725, 745. And the reason why I can tell you the values is because I've been, you know, I've been selling now for um on, on ebay for 25 years no tw almost 26 years um and before that i was selling at the um i-76 antique mall um selling on ebay etsy uh oh tias t-i-a-s uh, there were many different sites that I was selling on uh, back in the day. And um, yeah, and I'm still on eBay now. Um, if you wanted to see my eBay, someone asked in my last video, just go over to my YouTube main page. Um, and there is a link to my eBay store. So you can see the pieces that I feature on eBay. Why I bring this on is, yesterday I talked about brush, pearl, and gold. Let me see where this is signed. Yep, there it is. It's underneath the leaf. All right. And sometimes these marks are very hard to see and you will miss them. There it is. Trafari, right there with the copyright C, cast in place, riveted together. Again, two-part construction, these rivets holding this frog in place, you know, holding Mr. Frog over these stones. So this frog climbing over pearls like bubbles, um, 
I have never seen this pin in real life. Uh, I had a friend years ago that was on an online forum, um, and she had this brooch, and I think back then it sold for $300. Uh, this is going to be tough to be, um, for me to come up with a value on. This, this, sometimes I will get stumped by a piece. This is either $250 or, or you know, $650. Um, so if I go to sell this, I would be comfortable putting it out at like 375, 385, and accepting an offer. If it sells right away, I would sell. Whoops, I could have gotten a little bit more for it. <laughs> back in the day, I paid twelve dollars for this back in the day, um, and I loved the gesture of the frog. And I just didn't sell it because there was something about this that I loved this design. Um, very realistic, looks like fine jewelry, looks like gold, looks like a cabochon emerald. Again, we have that um, kind of just, you know, flattened cabochon eye. What great craft, though. Whimsical design. Really fantastic. Very simple. So they just had to cast metal, and, and I, I don't want to make it sound that simple because they had to cast the metal and then finish it. Costume jewelry, there's a lot of labor that goes into this. Um, but the end result was very simplified, is what I'm going for. And um, some days I need a translator, and I think this is one of them. <laughs> so this is beautifully done, beautifully crafted, but I wanted to bring that up. And so dimensional. Maybe that's where my brain was going, is look at the dimension of that frog holding on to pearls. Now I'm going to bring this on, and I'm going to kind of uh, call it a day. Um, and, you know, I want you to understand, I'm so happy with what you've done for me. Um, I want to continue to do these educational, uh, fancy shows and tells from my collection, and also show you that you can go out and find these pieces in real life. Okay, you really can. Um, it, it's uh, the treasure hunt is part of the excitement, just like the uh, Trafari bee earrings from earlier today. I've had those maybe three times in my life, and I've sold them each and every time. And um, I would say this is. You know, I didn't expect to find this today at the flea market. This is the grand finale for today. I will be honest and, and upfront and tell you, I've never seen this brooch before, ever. I've never seen it in a book. I've never seen it online. I've never seen it on a website. Um, I've never seen it in a chat forum. I've seen a brooch like this. And, and the similar brooch like this had... Um, this kind of border that was a little bit more simplified and asymmetrical from the top and the bottom. And I'm describing the other brooch because it's important um, to understand. So there was kind of a, a scene, um, like a landscape scene at the bottom. And then over this was like a, 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 a water scene of cattails and a swan. And, um, you know, I forget there was something else here. And then the top was just kind of finished. Very reminiscent of this to where they had a very large blue faceted stone um, inset from behind. So like this, it was inset from the back. This is signed Trafari. Let me back this out. And let me see. Yep, here we go. Let me see. We're marked. Whoops. We're marked right there. Right here. And then let's see here. We are marked somewhere else on here, I thought. Let me get my loop out and take a look and make sure that I'm showing you correctly. And I appreciate you taking the pause with me. Yep, okay. So let me flip this this way now. Okay, that mark is so small. And I'm gonna explain this. Look really close for these marks. Look how tiny that is. Trafari. And it's a little smudged because where they hit the metal was right on the top of that flower. Trafari. Look how small that mark is. Now, the person that sold this to me back in the day totally missed the mark. The construction's correct. The rhodium plating is correct. This brooch is a monster. Very, very large. V incredible. Each flower is then inset with rhinestones, and those are carefully set. And then look at the enameling on the twigs. I'm going to give you a value that seems to be excessive, but I would imagine this brooch would sell anywhere between two and three thousand. Now, the swan brooch with the landscape that went above the stone, it was much more complex than this. The end result, as beautiful as this, though, that I think sold a few years ago for eight thousand two hundred dollars. So pot metal, rhinestone and glass can the, the, the materials can transcend um, just the materials. It's the artistry, it's the craft, it's the depth of surface, it's the skill that it took to put these things together. Doesn't that look like a giant 
Ceylon sapphire um, and framed with diamonds, ruby, and enamel. It looks like authentic, real jewelry. Um, and as I zoom out, again, look how gigantic this is for a brooch. So I show this to you because back in the day, I paid $30 for this. Three zero. Thirty dollars. So just be careful when you look at certain designs, you look at certain designers. I would have bought this even though it wasn't signed Trafari. I always bought my things based on craft and design. And then if it was signed, I was grateful that it was signed. I will get into another video down the road that I will put my money where my mouth is and I will tell you some unsigned work is worth far greater than its counterparts that are signed. So please be careful not to base value or appreciation on a designer signature. I will say that much. I thank you all so much. Please go enjoy your Saturday. Again, this is my sixth day. I'm going to have a grand finale tomorrow. Take a couple days of rest, and I'll be back with you next week with more videos. Again, thank you so much for joining in. Um, and the grand total um, of this collection, um, just costume, I, I, can't, I can't even really add it up in my mind, but I'll do that really quick. Um, and maybe I'll put it in the title or description uh, just for uh, the fun of it. <laughs> so you take good care of yourselves. And again, thank you. I love you so much.